Thanks for joining me today. Thank you for having me here. It's great to have you. But I, I'd really love to, to start by getting to know you a little bit better. Um, and I wondered if you could just walk me through your, your career in music so far. My musical life so far has been quite a surprising journey, you could say. Um, I grew up in a house with almost any kind of instrument you could imagine. And I have three sisters and we were allowed to pick any instrument that we liked. And I completely fell in love with the cello. I have studied at the Royal Academy of Music in Copenhagen. And I graduated in 2010. And after studying very intensely for, for um, five, seven years, I felt I need to go out and, and use the music out in the world. And I went to the most crazy places like like Bhutan, who has seen a cello in Bhutan? Nobody, nobody knows what a cello is. I found out that even though I couldn't speak with people, they didn't speak English, I really felt connected. When, when I started playing, we had this common feeling of we are humans and uh, we have something in common. We have the, the feelings in common. So it was a, a, a great way to, to do some real life education, something you cannot learn in, in school. After traveling a lot, um, I thought I wanted to investigate about Bach's music. Because you know Bach yeah. is this, this guy with a wig and nice clothes and everything. And he had something like 20 kids. And then I heard that when he was 20 years old, he walked 400 kilometers to meet this uh, guy, Buxte Hood, a composer and organ player, because he admired him and I wanted to do the same thing. Um, but walking 400 kilometers with a cello is almost impossible. So I took my bike, I went the same route, and I played his music for 10 concerts along this route. I really got to understand what kind of person he was, and he must have been a little bit more of a fiery soul, rebel, somehow to go through all that to meet somebody that he knew, he admired, and he wanted to learn from. And it has really influenced my interpretations of Bach, and I dare to do things I didn't dare to do before, because I know he, he had also this little bit crazy side to him. That started my whole bicycling cello career, you could say. And since then, I've been biking many, many places in Europe and Denmark many times. I don't know how many thousands of kilometers I've been biking around with a cello. And it's all because I think that when I'm on tour by bike, I get to experience whatever's along the route. And it inspires me. I meet people, I hear their life stories, and it makes the music come alive in a different way than if I have been sitting, sitting alone in my, in my practice room, and then I go out and I play, and I don't even know who's listening. I think it's really important to have this connection uh, to the person listening or to the, the audience listening. So is, is Bach your only inspiration or is there something more that inspires you? Bach's music in itself is very inspiring. And you can play it a thousand times and it's still new. If it's rainy one day, it tells one story and on a, like the first day of spring, it tells a different story. Bach was super intelligent and he did a lot of uh, magic with numbers. He could also somehow put his own name in the music, like the tones B, A, C, H can be hidden. If you compare pieces, you can find that three pieces that you usually play together have the exact same number of bars. And there m might be a repetition in the middle, which is exactly in the golden division, if you had the whole number of bars. You wouldn't notice until you, you go through it and really look closely what he did. It's really in inspiring in the same way as, as the structure of nature can be inspiring. Sometimes when I compose, I, I just let the music take on its own life. Uh, a lot of the music I compose is a little bit like, uh, you could say, when I'm on a tour by bike, 
and I experience lots of things. And I can use my cello as a, a diary, a musical diary. So whatever I experience, I can, I can save for later in a piece of music and share it in a different way with people than when you tell what happened. I had gotten inspiration from meetings with people and just being in amazing uh, surroundings of nature. And then I bike around and suddenly there's a melody in my head and I have to stop and get off the bike and unpack the cello and try it out. So definitely for me it's important that that the music has a connection to life. And that it's not only something I decided on while I was sitting alone in my practice room. And we have the Danish composer Carl Nielsen who said, music is life. And I completely agree. The, the connection there between nature, music uh, uh, and math is, is incredibly strong. And it's, yeah. it's like a, a code behind, yeah. behind the music. When you compose music, of course, you have a, an idea about a combination of tones. Mm -hmm. But a combination of tones is just sound. It's just like, there's no, nothing in that. But there's something in it, when you get the idea for a melody, you are in a specific mood, and this mood has this melody in it. And then the composer writes it down. The musician has to unpack it, but you cannot just unpack the, the tones. You have to. To get there, you have to have a feeling of what made the composer write this piece of music. And then you find that inside yourself. It's interesting to find something inside yourself you, you know Bach also experienced. It's a human feeling inside yourself that has been the same today as 300 years ago. And, and you share it. You share it through the music and it can travel out in the whole room. And to anybody who's listening, you're sharing this feeling which you have inside. Somehow you know how did they feel way back in time in 17 something. And maybe that's how they will feel again in 300 years from now, if we are still here. You were talking, talking previously about your, your traveling yeah. and, and the way that you overcame communication difficulties with, with music. I think one thing is that you always tune your instrument before you play. Of course, it has to be in tune, and you can use your phone, right, <laughs> or a tuner. Um, but you also have to, to tune your soul. You have to tune yourself. If you have, like, your heart, and it's, it's a map of your heart, and we have all the different feelings. We have love, we have frustration, we have peace, we have everything is there, right? And then you have to, to be of course, it's nicest to be in the love section or the happiness section. And, and, and when you're there, you find the right flavor for this piece of music. And, and that's what's on the dish. <laughs> that's what's on the menu. The nuances of sound are somehow, um, they're very subtle. And you can have, in, in music we say, a piano, a yeah. very soft tone, a very quiet thing. But that's just a volume, but the, the, the whole um, texture and the articulation of the tone determines what is this kind of piano? Is this like, I'm telling you a secret? Or, I mean, that, that would be quite articulated and, and low. Or is it me uh, on my bike humming for myself? <laughs> That's a much more relaxed piano. But piano and music is not only uh, a mimicking of, of speech, it's also a, a mimicking of many things. It could be, you know, you watch a child sleeping. It feels so quiet just watching it. It is quiet, but the feeling is very quiet. And that can also turn into music like a lullaby. Mm -hmm. That would be quiet in a very different way than a piece about a secret you're telling. And, um, and to me, when it gets really interesting about music is when you get from this point of for the piano and uh, all the notes to what's behind it and uh, the, the, the heart to heart communication as we talked about. Yeah, that's, that's music to me. It's, uh, you can say the, the eye is, is like the, the mirror of the soul, um, but in a way, the ear is a, a door to the soul. You can enter the soul through the ear. And I was completely blown away 
by the level of detail that you describe the sound. Yeah. Like, I, I, it, you're taking it to another level. It's so important to have the, the details. The attention to the details makes the whole difference. You might get to one point with the big structure, but then the last few details makes everything. I think it's a, an incredible thought that we can influence people, influence people's emotions yeah. even more yeah. with sound than we can with, with visuals. There might be a thousand words in a picture, but there's a million in, in, a, in a melody. But your care and attentiveness to sound, it, you, you take it to another level to understand the, the instrument that you're performing it on to such a degree that you've even decided to, to build your own. I was looking for an instrument with, um, with a lot of deep overtones. I think the best quality about the cello is its warmth and the deep feeling you have from this instrument. I also love like a violin has all the brilliance and all that kind of bright thing. I really get inspired from the deep register on the cello and I wanted an instrument that, that had a lot of deep overtones. And uh, from the 10 cellos I have, I noticed that the cellos that are wider, okay. of course, has a softer tone and more of the deep overtones. It's, it's like intuitively you will know that that's how it works. When the wood has a, a soft structure, okay. the deep overtones comes alive in a different way. They get more um, elasticity. Structure as in the, the choice of the wood? Well, the choice of the wood yeah. is, is really important for the okay. instrument. And I got this beautiful piece of spruce for the front. And it's, uh, it's, it has been growing kind of fast. Okay. Uh, and you can see that it has actually year rings here. It's almost one centimeter wide. So the spruce is a soft wood? It's a soft wood. Yeah. It's usually the hardwood that's more expensive, but I was going for this because this, I knew, would give me the soft tone and the, the deep feeling. And, uh, I, yeah, I, I simply wanted an instrument that, that could, could express something like deep, a little bit maybe dangerous deep, but okay. also friendly deep. Yeah. Um, so I built it just the way I wanted it and with small adjustments to... Um, to the measurements, mm -hmm. it's a little bit shorter than a standard cello, and the curve on the strings is a little bit bigger, so I have more room. I can kind of be uh, more in the string and go really intense without hitting two strings at the same time. Small things that, for a musician, makes the whole difference in your everyday life. There's so many factors that influence the sound on an instrument, and it's impossible to know how they affect each other. But one thing that any cellist know is that the bridge has two different designs. And okay. what I put on here is called the Belgian bridge. It holds up the strings and the strings start their vibration from the rosin on the horsehair. And the vibration travels through the bridge down to the instrument. Inside the instrument, are two secret uh, amplifiers, you could say. Okay. Acoustic amplifiers. One is the bass bar, which is here. Uh, and um, that distributes, this distributes the, um, the deep tones. And over on this side is something called the sound post. Uh, it's not that rom romantic of a word in, in English, but in Italian it's called anima, which okay. literally means the soul of the instrument. Wow. And this is uh, connecting front and back. And the placement of that little piece of wood is so essential to the character of the instrument. I've put mine quite, quite far from the bridge to make it friendly. Okay. If I moved it closer to the bridge, I would get more of an extroverted instrument, kind of yelling, very uh, bright. Uh, so I, sometimes I, ch I change the position of this one depending on the weather. If it's, if it's really dry, I have to move it a little bit 
away, because otherwise the tone becomes very direct. The bridge here, as I said, also it's very different the sound you get from this one. The Belgian model is actually more bright and the French one is more mellow. Mm -hmm. But since my cello is already mellow, I, I choose uh, the bright bridge to give it a little bit more clearness in the tone, and it's a little bit more articulation. And you have to find the right combination. So soft wood goes well with a, a bright bridge. Yes. But if the wood was dense and uh, made this very clear tone, I would probably put a French, French bridge with a, with a less direct tone. To, to resonate together, it's, it's all about you know, the, the frequencies matching yeah. and everything just sings, yeah. right? Yeah. That's a really good analogy. Since I got in contact with you and Videx, I really, I've started to, to be aware about sounds in a different way. Um, and how important it is to us that, that we can hear um, and how important, how many informations we get through the subtleties of, of sound. A word is just a word, but how you say it makes the whole difference.